I have a couple of things to do and announce before we announce our speaker today. Number one, I'd like to remind you that following this um, last event, at one o'clock today in the Bonner Room, there will be a panel discussion regarding the topic for this week, National Healthcare Debate in America. Number two, um, over the years, for 20 years, we've had some remarkable speakers, and you might wonder where we obtain these people. <laughs> Ruth Album, would you please stand up? This is Ruth Album from Beverly Hills, California, and she is the lady who provides us with these marvelous speakers. Hooks us up and has for 20 years. Well, it has been said that in vaudeville, they save the best acts for last. Today is no exception. I think we've just done just that. I want to welcome you to the last day of the North Idaho Convocation and Popcorn Forum, the 1994 debate on health care in America. Today we are very honored to have a visit from Dr. Paul Saltman, who's a noted biologist, author, lecturer, researcher, and administrator. Since 1967, Dr. Saltman has been a professor of biology at the University of California in San Diego. He has served as provost of Ravel College and vice chancellor for academic affairs. Dr. Saltman holds a bachelor's, degree, bachelor's of science degree in chemistry and a PhD degree in biochemistry from California Institute of Technology. He served as professor at the University of Copenhagen and at Murdoch University in Australia. After his postgraduate degree work at the College de France in Paris, uh, in addition, for 14 years, he was a faculty member at the University of Southern California School of Medicine. Dr. Saltman's field of expertise has led to the publishing of two books on nutrition, the California Nutrition Book and the New Nutrition. Um, I could proceed to list his numerous awards, however, that would lead to little time for Dr. Saltman's presentation. Therefore, I want to welcome him most heartily on this last day of our symposium, Universal Healthcare in America. I'm going to take this out of here because I'm a little taller. My nutrition was better than I was. <laughs> I hope you all wake up in the morning and read a morning newspaper, even the Coeur d'Alene Press, which I did this morning on arising because uh, I really feel if you don't read at least one newspaper in the morning that you don't realize that you're a part of the world and the universe. And uh, I'm always looking at the newspaper because uh, it, it tells us a lot about ourselves if we read it carefully. There are a couple of very interesting articles this morning uh, and I want to bring them to your attention. The first uh, article uh, regards the testimony in Washington uh, yesterday. Some of you may have seen it on television. The headlines uh, say, Twinkies don't kill. <laughs> Lawmakers take tobacco executives to task. And I had the pleasure of watching television and seeing uh, a Congressman Waxman berating these uh, nine executives from the big tobacco companies, all of whom swore that they believed that the uh, nicotine and that smoking was not addictive. And, uh, and this Congressman Waxman blurting out, he says, cigarettes kill, but Twinkies don't kill. <laughs> Twinkies can kill, <laughs> if you eat enough of them. And we're going to talk about that today. So I, I'm sending Congressman Waxman a copy of my book so I'll understand that. Uh, and we're going to talk about Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Do you remember the Goldilocks story? Not too little, not too much, but just right. It's also called moderation. But what does that word mean? How many packs a day is moderation? How many Twinkies a day is moderation? How many apples a day keep the doctor away? <laughs> and other belief systems for our time. Story number two. 
new treatment for osteoporosis. Did you read about that? Now a lot of the guys sit in this room smugly saying osteoporosis, that's for little old ladies. Guess again, boys. If you live to be approximately 45 years old, chances are you'll live to be about 80. Chances are if you live to be about 80 that you're going to have a good serious chance as a male of having osteoporosis. If you're a female and you're postmenopausal, chances are before you will die 40% that you will suffer a fracture of a vertebrae, a hip, a shoulder, or another major bone in your body. That's an epidemic, my friends. What are you doing about it? Anybody wear little red ribbons for osteoporosis? In point of fact, this story points out that if you take calcium and fluoride, that you can prevent bone loss in women. We've done a lot of stories and studies on this, and I'll be talking about them later. The point I want to make is that there is a huge literature out there. This isn't molecular biology. It's good, solid nutrition. Calcium and fluoride prevent bone loss. What are you doing about it? Not to be nervous. How many of you are doing a thousand milligrams of calcium a day? Huh? How many are doing a quart of milk a day? How many realize that uh, Bud Light is zero in calcium? <laughs> On the next page, there's a very interesting story about a fellow by the name of Kurt Cobain who met an untimely ending recently. He may have been an idol to some of you. Question, why is suicide the number three killer of young people in America today? Do you understand that? Isn't that the ultimate self-abuse? And oh, by the way, where you really learn about the nature of the universe is in the comic strip, right? This morning's comic strip of Garfield, I must read it to you, you know. Uncle Paul reads the funnies to the kiddies. In Garfield today, Garfield's master, whose name I disremember now, that shows you I don't follow literature, uh, he says, Garfield, I know food is important to you, but there are limits, like worshiping a donut. And uh, of course, Garfield is lying prostrate before a donut saying, don't anger the gods. <laughs> what has uh, all this got to do with us today in wellness? I think it's got everything to do with it. Because in the few minutes we have together, I'd like to talk about some of the concepts that I've been brooding about for many, many years. And my brooding is not a brooding that leads to, uh, to self-abuse and suicide. My broodings try to force me to think about myself and myself in relationship to other people and, and to worry about fundamental issues and problems and what we can do about them. And over the years, I have brooded about the notion of a human potential. And I want to share those broodings with you. And in the context of considering the human potential, not generically, but specifically, the human potential of each one of us in this room today, if we can kind of think about that a little bit, maybe in understanding that, we can make a commitment, number one, to optimizing our own human potential, and in the process of doing so, commit ourselves to optimizing the potential of others. Now, that is a very fundamental dilemma in our society, isn't it? It goes under the notion of self and others. It talks about me, me, you, you, and is there a relationship? Briefly, because we just have so little time and I've got to leave time for you to brood out loud and talk and discourse about these matters. But I say to you that 
we live in a three-dimensional potential space. One of those dimensions, perhaps the most important one, and the one over which we have least control, is our genetic potential. What did each of us inherit from mom and dad? Set of DNA blueprints manifest in a fertilized egg, two cells, four cells, eight, sixteen, ten to the twelfth cells, you, me, in the blueprint of that DNA. Lacking a single enzyme, lacking a single gene, you know the consequences can be as drastic as never developing in the first place, or the catastrophic diseases of genetic mutation, or something as trivial of how tall are you? What color is your hair? Or your skin? Huh? Or your eyes? Those are trivial. But also we inherit quite clearly the ability to develop a central nervous system as well as a body. And that's one potential. Can we do anything about that? Hmm? The answer is we're trying like hell. That's what genetic engineering is all about. Missing an enzyme, immune deficiency disease, genetically engineer the ability of a child to receive that enzyme and to be cured, it is happening now. But are you waiting for the gene to be cured so that you can be genetically engineered to have an IQ of a 180? Don't hold your breath. But it's important that we understand our genetic potential because some are more or less blessed than others and in that context must behave according to our genes, not in spite of or in opposition to them. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But suffice it to say, there are fat genes and thin genes, and if you've got fat genes, don't say, God gave me fat genes, I can't do anything about it. Say, I got fat genes, I got to eat less and exercise more. Are you ready for that? Mom died of breast cancer. Grandma died of breast cancer. Am I going to die of breast cancer? If you have that risk, you're sure not going to behave in a fashion that would what? Promulgate that risk, would you? You'd be very defensive about a lot of things that you do. And so it goes. Dimension one of the human potential, your genes. Dimension two of your human potential. Brood about this one a little bit. You live in an environment that is physical, chemical, and biological. And your potential is enormously influenced by those environments, aren't they? Physical potential? What are you talking about? Hey, when you were in mom's belly, did she get x-ray? Did you get x-ray? Did you go out and sit on a surfboard like I do as a kid and get those deep tans so you'd really get the chicks to covet your bod and wind up in the hands of a surgical dermatologist? What price, glory. Those are physical environments, aren't they? You know, what is a bullet ripping through a body? That's a change in the physical environment, isn't it? What's a Ferrari or a motorcycle going into a concrete abutment doing at 60 miles an hour? It's changing your physical environment, isn't it? Oh my. And what about your chemical environment? Have you ever thought about that? Huh? Was mom well nourished? Did she have enough folic acid? Did she have enough iron? Did she have enough essential amino acids? Did she have enough calories? Oh. Increasingly, we learn, and it was in the paper just two days ago, I trust you read it. Did you read the Carnegie Report on the state of children in America? 25% of the children of the infants born in America today are to unwed, teenage, 
mothers who are malnourished and these, chi these children are born underweight, malnourished themselves, and doomed, doomed because the chemical environment in utero was such that they could not fully develop. Hey, are you aware, speaking of health care, of the statistics of infant mortality in America compared with other nations in the world? What are we, 12th, 13th, maybe 14th? And you know why? Malnourishment among the poor. The chemical environments, huh? And so what happens? The child is born. What does that child become nourished by? A mother's breast? A mother's breast who herself is malnourished? What good is that milk? What nutrients, what supplements are given to that child to grow? Who suckled you? Who suckled me? Who fed us? Who saw to us that as we grew and we developed that we had the proper nutrients in our diet to maximize that genetic potential with which we were born? Well, if you were lucky, you had parents who cared. And if you didn't, we hoped that the system, the system being the schools and the school lunch programs and school breakfast programs were such to provide that. But without proper nourishment, what's going to happen? Oh, by the way, speaking of chemical environments, did you know what the most serious nutritional disease in America is? I will tell you. It's obesity. Obesity is a disease. Obesity is not whether you think you can't get into your bikini of a given summer, huh? Obesity is by definition being 20% above the weight which is ideal for your age, sex, and height. That is a medical issue, and we'll talk more about that. Well, that's too much chemistry, isn't it? That's too much thermodynamics. That's too many calories, period. That's the chemical environment. What else is a chemical environment? Drugs, alcohol, smoking. Every one of those is altering our chemical environment. Every one of those chemicals profoundly affects our human potential. Pox on those guys from the cigarette companies. The data is clear and unambiguous. For those of you who feel that it's somehow all of those terrible organic chemicals that are being spewed forth by this industrial capitalistic exploitative society, you should take a look at the epidemiology, my friends. Over the last 70 years in the United States of America, there has been no significant increase in the aged normalized incidences of cancer with the exception of one form of cancer, just one, and that's cancer of the lung. And that correlates directly with smoking. All of this nonsense that we have polluted our life and cancer is up has no substantive epidemiological evidence whatsoever. And the biological environment? Need we talk about the ability to vaccinate and the fact that we are not vaccinating our children in America today? Do you want to talk about AIDS? That's a biological curse. Huh? What do you want to talk about? Do you want to talk about clean water supplies, healthy food? Well, it's not bad in America, but it could certainly be a lot better. What do you do? What do you do about protecting yourself? from sexually transmitted diseases. Self-abuse, the human potential, or a pregnant mother with measles, and a malformed teratological child. Hmm? Dimension three. And this is going to kind of weird you out a little bit. It weirded me out for a while until I put it all together in my own head. It's called the sentient environment, 
What is the sentient environment? Well, you guys are all hip in biology, and you know that the brain received, receives five kinds of sensory inputs, correct? What you see, you hear, you smell, you taste, you touch. What do you see? You see art or graffiti? Can your eyes visualize letters and put letters together in the form of words to make poetry, to write laws? Mm -hmm. huh? What do you smell? The stench of a ghetto or the pine trees and firs of a sovereign Idaho? Hmm? What do you hear? <coughs> Music? Language? Who caresses you? And whom do you caress? Now what has all this got to do with your human potential? Those sentient inputs to the developing brain completely and totally and irreversibly affect what happens to your mind and ultimately to your consciousness. You cannot think thoughts if you have not heard them expressed and communicated them with language or seen it in the written word. And you say, Saltman, you're getting freaky. I'm a biologist. You want experiments? You remember a guy named Harry Harlow in Wisconsin? Did any of you ever see the Harry Harlow experiments on film? Tell your psych profs to get those films out and look at them. Harry Harlow takes baby monkeys away from their mother and he puts these baby monkeys into a cage in which there is constant sound, constant food, constant temperature, constant light. There are no sentient inputs to those monkeys. Those monkeys are totally apart from their parents, from their brothers, from their cousins. And you know what happens to the monkeys? They become psychopathic monkeys and can never be taken back into the society of monkeys. Let me tell you another experiment because I love this experiment. It was done by a guy named Rosenzweig up at Berkeley who was an experimental psychologist and my old TA from Caltech, Eddie the Bennett, a biochemist, okay? Just to remind you about genetics, you can take rats and you can breed rats to run mazes faster or slower. Now, among experimental psychologists, some will say to you that the ability to learn to run a maze is a function of intelligence. Fair enough, grant me that for the moment. Granted that for the moment, then I tell you I can breed rats that run fast and rats that run slow. The swift and the dog. And I can show you that I can breed these animals and they will breed true. <sighs> Given. And no matter what you do to the dull animals, nothing happens. They don't get much better. And Ed Bennett comes onto the scene and he says, let's figure out what that is biochemically, what genes are at play, and so what Ed does, he takes the slow rats and the fa fast rats and he snips off their head and the heads drop into liquid nitrogen and they take out the brain tissue and they analyze it for an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase, which I'm sure you all learned about in your introductory science courses here. Acetylcholinesterase, as you know, is an enzyme which is involved in metabolism of neurotransmitter substances in the brain. And guess what? The fast rats have significantly more acetylcholinesterase in their brain than the dull rats. Uh-oh. Then he does the third experiment. Oh, by the way, if you nutritionally deprive the rats as they're growing up, you can reduce the level of acetylcholinesterase in their brain, and you can slow down the rate at which they learn to run the maze. You dig that? Now, le pièce de résistance. 
Rosenzweig takes his class, graduate students, experimental psychology, divides the class into two sections. He says, I'm going to give you guys over here smart rats to work with, baby smart rats. I'm going to give you guys dull rats over on this side of the room, and you're going to have six weeks with those rats. You can do whatever the hell you want with those rats. See what you can do in terms of the running time in the mazes of these rats. And we'll see if you can really improve the running time among the dull ones, huh? And lo and behold, six weeks pass. Sure enough, the rats trained by the folks on this side of the room run very much faster than the rats trained by these folks in the room. You would expect that, wouldn't you? But beware dishonest professors. Rosenzweig lied. The rats were litter mates. They were identical. They were both rats, sub rats, were smart rats. What was different? Well, while these students thought that they were doing the experiment, in point of fact, Rosenzweig was looking at them through a one-way mirror. And what Rosenzweig observed was that these students who had the smart rats were treating them like you wouldn't believe. They were bringing in goodies, they were blowing them, they were rubbing, they were with them night and day, teaching them to run the maze because they were smart rats and they were going to really get the big champs out of these, huh? And you thought that you got the dummies, huh? You got the dummies. What the hell did you do with the dummies? You fed them rat chow and you said, what the hell? You can't learn. You're a dummy. Chop, chop, off with their heads. Identical genes. Non-identical sentient environments. And in the sentiently deprived animals, there was significantly less acetyl cholinesterase in the brain. <coughs> Do you dig what I'm saying? Do you hear me? Question. How's your sentient environment lately? Are you waiting for some teacher to blow in your ear and rub your back? How much do you care? That is to me, my friends, the human potential. And what do I say to you when I talk about that human potential? I tell you that those three dimensions are interactive, aren't they? Given a set of genes, you can do what with it? You can enhance it to maximize it by nutrition and by physical and biological environment and by enhancing the sentient environment. And lo and behold, if you change any of those parameters, it will change all of the other parameters as well, won't it? And the answer is, you bet, Doc. So the real issue is how do we optimize our own human potential and how do we help to optimize others. It is absolutely essential, it seems to me, that we must have then, individually and collectively, an understanding of the forces in these three dimensions. We're beginning to understand genes pretty well now, aren't we? We're beginning to understand through modern molecular biology what these genes are doing and how they do it and how they're regulated and so on. If you don't understand that, you go around and you say, well, I can't help myself. I don't know, I don't know ma'am. I don't understand. I don't. If you don't understand the nature of the physical laws that govern our universe, you're going to go out there without sunscreen on and say you want to be a bronze god, you're immortal. Hmm? And you're going to talk about your nutrition, believing that there are health foods and junk foods, aren't you? And you say, I don't have to protect myself. I'm clean and she's clean. 
Or are you going to believe that graffiti is art? And that heavy metal is music? Very interesting. I want to use the example of nutrition for a moment because that's a field I'm entered and engaged in and try to indicate to you at using nutrition as sort of a, a case study. And I can only do this in a briefest format because there's an awful lot to learn about what I'm talking about. For example, you know, we talked about Garfield worshiping the donut, right? As many of us worship things, like some of you may worship the Big Mac and others of us may worship pâté or foie gras, some others may, you know, believe in bean sprouts and brown rice, uh, some may eat kosher and some may believe in all sorts of Szechuan or Cantonese, whatever it is, you know, we have these belief systems. Hmm? And you don't appreciate for a moment the fact that food is metaphysics. Food is metaphysics. It's taste, it's culture, it's religion, it's ethnicity, it's economics, it's social strata. But nutrition is an exact science. Now how can we say nutrition is an exact science? Well, I'm going to tell you an experiment that happened about 23, 24 years ago today in Toronto, Canada. It's a strange kind of experiment. A woman by the name of Judith Taylor goes into surgery complaining of pains in her belly. The surgeons open her up and she's got gangrene throughout her entire intestinal tract. The surgeon turns to a physician who's standing in the operating room and says, Dr. Gigi Boy, what do you want to do tonight? And Dr. Gigi Boy said, take it out. And that night in Toronto, Canada, the surgeon removed Judith Taylor's entire intestinal tract. And he turned her over to Dr. Gigi Boy, who from that moment on to this very day, had the responsibility of seeing that Judith Taylor got the nutrients her body required intravenously out of a plastic bag. That's called total parenteral nutrition. And that night was different from all other nights because that was the night that Dr. Gigi Boy had done his last experiments using dogs in an experimental strategy in which Dr. Gigi Boy could put into the bag enough calories to sustain life. The previous problem was that you could not sustain human life with the energy from carbohydrates in the form of glucose or from the amino acids. You could not get enough sugar and amino acids into a human body without overloading the body with water and thus destroying the electrolyte balance. But that night, Dr. Gigi Boy had perfected the use of phospholipids, lecithin, as a source both of energy and of nutrient. And Judith Taylor is alive today. She hasn't touched a morsel of food. She has not touched a drop of water or any other liquid. Everything that Judith Taylor has needed to sustain life was given to her intravenously three times a day from a bag dripping in to her superior vena cava. She's not a case alone. Tens of thousands of people have been living on total parenteral nutrition. We have raised infants from prematurity to adulthood fully nourished without ever having touched food or liquid. Colleagues, I hold to you that's an exact science. How exact is it? I can tell you. I could name for you the 44 chemicals. Chemicals, did you hear me say that dirty word? 44 chemicals in a plastic bag that sustains life and growth, that optimizes the nutrition potential of a human being. 
Now, what has that got to do with you? The answer is everything. Not that I want you to go on the bag. It's very expensive. $65,000, $70,000 a year to be on the bag. How much is a human life worth? How much is it worth to you to tell? Hmm? How much is it worth to an infant who has, from birth, no intestinal tract to absorb the food? Or has a cancer, has to have it removed, no intestinal tract? Hmm? How much pleasure? Hi, come on over, we'll have a couple of bags together. <laughs> Gosh, that bag was so terrific, I think I'll have seconds. By the way, by the way, that bag is very interesting to me, because once I understand that, then the issue of food becomes very clear, doesn't it? What is food? Food is just a very pleasurable and inexpensive way of getting the 44 chemical nutrients into me, isn't it? Oh my. In Judah Taylor's bag, the percent of calories from fat is between 50 and 55 percent. Did you hear that number? Because I want you to all put your hand over your heart and say, but Doc, the American Heart Association says God's number is 30 percent. And I will tell you, I look up at the ceiling and I don't see it written 30 percent. And God was smarter than that. She invented the laws of thermodynamics. <laughs> And what do the laws of thermodynamics tell us? It tells us that a calorie is a calorie is a calorie. And it doesn't matter whether that calorie comes from fat, or that calorie comes from carbohydrate, or that calorie comes from protein. The laws of thermodynamics tell us very simply, Energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It can only be transformed from one form to another. You say, stop doing that. I don't have to take that course. Let me translate that into basic nutrition you can understand. If you eat it and you don't burn it, you sit on it. You dig that? <laughs> That's absolute and unequivocal. Oh, I see. So what's the issue with Judah Taylor? Not 55% fat in the diet compared to this magic 30%. So what is it? It's that you've got to have enough calories to sustain life and growth and physical activity. Well, what's this about fat? Why are these doctors, real doctors? I'm not a real doctor, forgive me. You know. I'm not licensed to kill in California. But I work with these guys. And I'll tell you what the issue is, very simply. And when you push them up against the wall in a debate, in a scientific meeting, they'll admit to this. Fat has nothing to do with anything except one thing, and that thing is fat makes food taste good. Taste, sentient environments, we are sensual creatures. We love to eat fat foods. You put a person on a 30% fat diet and the food will taste so lousy that they won't eat it and therefore they will lose weight and therefore they will be healthy because you will decrease the level of obesity. Suddenly I move from what? From biochemistry to metaphysics? Taste, sensuality? You think sensuality has nothing to do with food? Hmm? First I would remind the older people in the audience and the younger ones should go rent the tape. They should see a film called Tom Jones. Because see, you, there's a sensual woman. I can tell by her laughter. Why? Because there is a scene, the most erotic piece of filmmaking ever made is in that film, so that'll get you to rent it right away. 
And that piece of about three and a half minutes, and I show it to my nutrition class, is a scene between a very handsome guy and this beautiful woman, and they're fully clothed. You say, what the hell kind of sensuality is that? Everything is happening with food as metaphor for sex. It is beautiful. Well, you see, you know, you're sick, Saltman. Let me give you, again, I always have to, when this happens, when they say, oh, well, that's your hang-up. Let me tell you about rats and pigs. Are you ready for this one? Hmm? Take a pig, because they're very much like people. And uh, make that pig zinc deficient. Now, everything else in the diet is there, but no zinc. Trace element, zinc is in the bag, by the way. It's one of the 44 chemicals. And uh, you take uh, this uh, zinc deficient pig, and you, uh, you put food and water into the cage, and the pig will not eat it and will die of starvation. And you know why? Because on a zinc-free diet, the pig loses its ability to taste. How do you know that? Do you talk to the pig? No, but you put people on zinc-free diets and they lose their appetite. And when food is not tasted, one does not eat it. Oh, you say, what has that got to do with Darwin and survival? Experiment two, take a rat, put a microelectrode in the hypothalamic region. Rat learns to press the lever and give itself a microshock and the hypothalamus, boom, 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 boom. I dig it, man, I dig it. I love it, I love it. Oh, more, more, more. And you put food and water in the rat's cage and the rat won't stop pressing the lever and dies of starvation. Tell me about drugs and alcohol and cigarettes and maximizing the human potential. What is this business about nutrition? Why do I pick up a morning newspaper the other day to read that the latest experiments out of Finland and the U.S. about antioxidants and cancer and coronary heart disease show that over five to eight years there is zero effect of antioxidants on coronary heart disease and cancer. And how many of you out there believe Linus Pauling? How many of you believe in vitamin E? Believe in beta carotene? Believe in ascorbate? Believe in selenium? Believe in fresh fruits and vegetables? Hey, I believe about all of those, but my belief systems are predicated on scientific data. There is no evidence in prospective experiments that antioxidants above the US RDAs will prevent or cure any disease. And I work in the field of radical oxidative damage to cells. But people want to believe. Why do we want to believe those things? We want to believe, and I talk to smokers, they tell me, I'm not nervous about smoking. Doc, Linus tells me if I take 12 grams of vitamin C, I can smoke. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. There is no health food. There is no junk food. You think a Twinkie is junk? There's far more nutrients of those 44 nutrients in a Twinkie than there ever was in an apple. You think fiber is a nutrient? No. Fiber is a precursor for bowel movements. I believe in them. I wouldn't want to go without one. Do I think fiber will prevent or cure cancer? No. Do I believe that cholesterol in our diet is causing coronary heart disease? How could I believe that? How could the American Medical Association, the American Heart Association say that? There isn't a shred of evidence for it. Do you know that? 
Do you know that you make 85% of the cholesterol that's in your body now from sugars and amino acids and fatty acids? Did you know that? 15% of your cholesterol you ate. And if your genes were decent, that 15% shut off the synthesis of that amount in normal processes of metabolism. You believe that salt causes hypertension? Nonsense. Obesity causes hypertension. And then if you have bad kidneys, then the salt exacerbates. You believe sugar causes hyperkinesis in kids? Not a shred of evidence to support that. Recent experiments once again reiterate. So what the hell are we talking about? What is all this good food, bad food? I'm going to give you some liberation. Today I'm going to liberate you biochemically. I'm going to tell you that the single most nutrient-dense food in a supermarket is a well-made pizza. Go forth <laughs> and enjoy. I'm going to tell you a couple stories and I'm going to quit because I want you guys to have a little time for questions. Two stories. I, I wrote this book. It's now called the UCSD Nutrition Book. And I gave Tony a copy, and I hope they'll get a copy in the library. And it's in paperback, and you should buy it. And it's wonderful because the two guys who helped me write it were serious journalists. And uh, there isn't a structural formula in there. There's not a balanced equation. It's a wonderful book. Anyhow, it's all scientifically correct. The point I want to make is the following. When I was out on the road with this book, the guy is looking through it, and and, 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 and this, this j disc jockey is saying to me, like, Dr. Saltman, you can't be serious. Do you mean to say that a Twinkie is better than an apple? I said, yes, that is correct. Nutritionally, a Twinkie is better than an apple. He says, that means that I can eat all the Twinkies I want. Mm -hmm. I said, colleague, do you understand the difference between freedom and anarchy? And uh, he paused because he didn't know what those two words meant. He was a disc jockey. <laughs> and uh, I pointed out to him that I thought the difference between freedom and anarchy, the freedom demanded personal responsibility. Huh? I think about this all the time because I want to go back to the metaphysics of food. Remember in the Old Testament and the Bible, the story of Adam and Eve? and in the garden, right? And uh, if you're a biochemical nutritionist, you say God was absolutely right when he said to Eve and to Adam, do not eat the apple, because it's not a very nutritious food, right? Wrong. What was the apple in the Garden of Eden? What? It was the knowledge the apple was an icon for knowledge, wasn't it? Very important fable. It bothers me that the Old Testament came out against knowledge. As a scientist, it goes against my belief systems. But put that aside for a moment, because fortunately, in the New Testament, I think it's in John, there's this wonderful line which I live by. Know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And that's what I am all about, and that's what I want you to be all about, to know the truth. Now, what is the truth? The truth is predicated in these instances about which I speak on scientific knowledge, not on belief systems. I won't argue with your metaphysics. I wouldn't argue with you about your God, my God, your food, my food, your taste, my taste but I will fight to the death for the 44 chemical nutrients in Judith Taylor's bag. Know the truth. The truth shall make you free. Assume the personal responsibility to manifest your optimal human potential. Help others manifest theirs. And oh, by the way, be very sensual and loving and happy people. Thank you very much. As many calories as kept Judith Taylor at her ideal body weight. 
That's the beauty. You can adjust that. Now, you see, everybody, when I start talking about nutrition, they want to talk diets. And I tell you, there are an infinite number of diets that are good for each one of us, and each one of us has different needs. The issue of how many calories should I eat every day should not be an issue at all. What you should do, the Saltman plan, is very simple. You get a bathroom scale and you put it in a bathroom, preferably in front of a full-length mirror. And every morning, naked, you stand on the scale and look at yourself in the mirror. And you won't have to count calories. You'll know when to exercise more and eat less until that needle comes down to where you should be. And everything else is trivial. Don't go on crash diets. Crash diets are obscene and absurd because you get into this yo-yo cycle, you change your metabolic rates, and as such, it's very easy to regain all of the weight that you lose. Take it down slowly, take it down with a combination of exercise and lower total amount of food you eat. Question. It wasn't a question of a chart. It was a question of a long series of human nutritional experiments. In the bag, I'll roughly go through it quickly. Water is in the bag. Calories are in the bag, both in the form of glucose, which is essential, and the polyunsaturated fatty acids and lipids of the, of the phospholipid. Uh, you have seven minerals in the bag, including the bulk minerals, calcium, magnesium, and so on. You have about nine, exactly nine, water-soluble, four fat-soluble vitamins. You have 10 trace elements, and you have 10 essential amino acids. That's all that's in the bag. I just gave you the bag. Now, how do you know that? What chart did they get it off of? That comes from maybe almost 60, 70 years of human experimentation. And then when it, one of the beautiful pieces about this at one point, after several years, Judith Taylor suddenly developed symptoms that looked like diabetes. And the docs went back and they found out that, that they had left chromium out of the bag. When they put the chromium back into the bag, the diabetes symptoms were alleviated. And so she has been fully sustained on that question. Uh, Sure. <laughs> Again, they're myths and magic, and the reality is very simple. Let me say simply, at, 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 to open up, there are as many calories in a gram of polyunsaturated fatty acids as there are in a gram of saturated fatty acids, statement number one. Statement number two, that polyunsaturated fatty acids refer to the fact that there are two or more double bonds in this fat, and that is where you, and the only place you find that, by the way, is in vegetable fat, mazola oil, corn oil, peanut oil, and so on. That's why it's a liquid. Okay. Monounsaturated fats, oleic acid, you find in olive oil. Saturated fats, you can find both in plants and in animals. Now, we cannot make polyunsaturated fatty acids, so you must have a certain amount, about a gram a day, of polyunsaturated fatty acids to maintain cell membrane integrity and to synthesize various hormones. <laughs> the thing that has come to fore lately about saturated and polyunsaturated fatty acids is that the heart people say you've got to have polyunsaturated fatty acids because that makes high density lipoproteins. That's the good news. That takes the cholesterol out of the body in the form of bile salts and that the saturated fatty acids cause low-density lipoprotein that leads to coronary heart disease. Meanwhile, the guys in the cancer business are saying polyunsaturated fatty acids cause cancer by becoming oxidized and making peroxides and causing cancer. So the issue is if you eat them, if you eat the polyunsaturated, you get cancer and you don't get heart disease, and vice versa, you get heart disease but no cancer. And my feeling is I'd rather die on a ski slope down in the deep powder than I would brooding about saturated versus unsaturated. So I think that there's a lot more myth than there is reality to that. One last question, because there would say me here. Yeah. Right here. No, that's totally wrong. There are no experiments in the bona fide literature to show that. Indeed, I've done experiments using milk and pasteurized milk as a source of calcium. It's a better source of calcium than calcium carbonate in Tums, for example. That's nonsense. The problem with diet in America is that women are taking an average of 500 to 550 milligrams of calcium a day. 
Our experiments show that if you don't get a thousand a day, you're going to lose bone. If you get a thousand a day and the trace elements, you can actually grow bone in a postmenopausal woman. So those results have been published. You don't have to look for miracle drugs. You have to have the knowledge so that you can take care of yourself. And then having that knowledge, you better go ahead and take care of yourself. Thank you very much, your one. Dr. Saltman, on behalf of the Convocations Committee and the Popcorn Forum Committee, thank you very much. You can see why he was a return to North Carolina College. He came in about 1977 or 78 and gave the commencement speech. And what a wonderful way to end the program. He's a very, very um, articulate and informative person. Uh, I also have his book, The University of California, San Diego Nutrition Book. Thank you for this book. And we will certainly also get uh, copies for the library. As we bring this week to a conclusion, I want to thank all of you, and particularly uh, the staff, the administration, board of trustees, uh, the faculty, and the students of our college, and particularly my colleagues in the faculty. Uh, they've been just wonderful, Dr. Saltman, and they bring uh, classes, and you can see the other notebooks, and this is an extended classroom into the auditorium. And Dr. Bennett always is so supportive to say uh, that we should encourage the students to be here. And Ruth, thank you for over, I guess now 24 years, Ruth is responsible for Dr. Saltman. We always speak on the phone as soon as we know what the topic is, and she assists along with others. Uh, I hope you will come to the panel at 1 o'clock this afternoon, and I have a wonderful announcement from Isla Jones, who's the chair of the North Carolina College Convocations Committee, and I as chair of the, of the Popcorn Forum. Next year will be the 25th anniversary of the Popcorn Forum. It's like a wedding the silver anniversary, the child is now an adult, and even beyond the teenage years, and we're going to celebrate that week in March 1995, and our topic next year is going to be the arts and humanities, and we're going to have a great time with poets and concert and drama and many other things, and so I know you'll want to celebrate with us as we celebrate for one week next year with the 25th. Please be with us at 1 o'clock, and thank particularly the students uh, for this learning process. It's been such a thrill to watch for 24 years as you go out of the auditorium with the smiles and with lots of information, and also for your outstanding questions. And finally, I certainly want to thank Lindy Turner and his staff, uh, what a remarkable group they are, and what a challenge we gave them on Monday when they had to go up on three channels on satellite to bring people from Washington, D.C., and they did it without a hitch. We have a super staff here to work with, and we hope to continue to bring ideas. And I will close with something I've never told you before, one of my great, great friends was the late Tom Emerson, and he used to take me to lunch quite often. The last lunch we had just before he died, he said, Tony, I'm on to you. I know what you're up to. I've got it figured out. And he, I said, what is it? He says, you're trying through the forum with other people like Allah to get people to think. And that's what it's all about. Thank you for coming. <laughs>